Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. I never can figure out how to use this. Uh, just press this button. Yeah, but then I can't see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is S. L. Lee, head of the mathematics department at the National University of Singapore. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the IMS lecture and to introduce the speaker. IMS is the acronym. Is it, is it okay? IMS is the acronym for the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, which is a university level institute independent of the Department of Mathematics and the Faculty of Science. The mission of IMS is to promote interest and foster research in mathematical sciences and its applications. It organizes programs that brings together foreign and local mathematicians and scientists with diverse backgrounds for interaction, for cross-fertilization of ideas, and for research collaboration. It organizes public lectures like this one to inform the public of the latest development, interesting ideas, as well as applications of mathematics. It goes now to schools to give lectures to N2S students to be interested in mathematics and take up career in science and mathematics. This evening's public lecture is organized by the Institute in conjunction with the Singapore Mathematical Society and the Department of Mathematics. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Stanley Osher, from the University of California at Los Angeles. Professor Osher is a well-known mathematician. He obtained his PhD from the Koran Institute at New York University. He joined the University of California at Los Angeles in 1976 before working briefly at Brookhaven Laboratory, uh, Brookhaven Research Laboratory, the University of California, Berkeley, as well as the State University of New York at Stony Brook. All these are famous institutes. Presently, Professor Osher is a professor and also Director of Applied Mathematics at the University of California at Los Angeles. Professor Osher is a distinguished mathematician, well known for his creativity and entrepreneurship, and is credited for many of the innovative numerical methods in solving partial differential equations with applications to many areas of science and engineering and also recently to image processing. In recognition for his contributions to mathematics and its applications, Professor Osher received many awards and honors including the NASA Public Service Group Achievement Award, the Japanese Society of Mecha Mechanical Engineers Computational Mechanics Award, and an invited speaker to the International Congress of Mathematicians, which is the most prestigious mathematics meeting in the world. Recently, he has also received the Siam Pioneer Prize which is awarded once every four years in conjunction with the International Congress of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Now, SIEM is the acronym for Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. 
Professor Usher, Usher is not only a distinguished mathematician, but also an entrepreneur. Now, he has co-founded three companies based in part on the results of his own research. Now, this is an example of what, in, in what we call in Singapore knowledge enterprise. And Professor Osher is a role model of knowledge entrepreneur. To be more precise, he is a role model of mathematical knowledge entrepreneur. Now today he's going to tell us what is all this about and on his talk entitled Mathematics in the Real World and the Fake World. So please join me to invite Professor Osher to deliver his lecture. Well, thanks. Uh, I've never given such a lecture, so uh, this should be interesting. Okay. Uh, so let's start with uh, an example of the real world. Here, here it is. Uh, that picture could use some image processing, especially on the right. What we see here is uh, an article in the LA Times uh, about nine years ago. That's my partner, Lenny Rudin, over here, if I can find, there he is. Uh, and that's me. And uh, I had more hair or something different here. Uh, and what happened was, this is an article about uh, our company. We had a, a company which specialized in image processing. And in 1992, there was a riot in Los Angeles. Uh, so we, had, we don't have uh, seasons in Los Angeles. We have riots, we have floods. We have, okay. So that, was, uh, that marked a certain passage. And after the riot, there was a trial of a guy who was accused of uh, beating up a truck driver. And uh, so we got a video. I'll show you a picture in a minute, which Raymond just got from me off the web, uh, of the uh, evidence that was used in court. And what we did was enhance the image. And actually, the bad guy got convicted. And uh, of course, he was out about a month later. But no, no, no. He was, he came out and a couple of years later, he's back in jail for good now, actually. Luckily for us. Uh, and uh, this developed into a lucrative business, of all things. We uh, developed a business which enhanced uh, videos, and uh, that was a consulting company. And eventually, I sold the company to Lenny, and he has a thriving business uh, selling software to uh, governments and uh, police departments around the world enhancing images. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll get a chance to discuss the mathematics of it a little bit. Uh, so we, Lenny was a very, this is an influential character in my life. Uh, he realized that there was a, a very beautiful observation, which tells you how mathematics works sometimes. I was minding my own business uh, doing shock calculations which means uh, when you drive in the, in the street and the, somebody jams the brakes on, the cars stop, the traffic gets a discontinuity, or if it's a jet passes the sound barrier, you have a supersonic boom. And what that is is really, now, there's a varying degree of sophistication in the audience, but uh, to put it mildly, uh, but what that really is, is something which looks like this, bop, like that. If, if uh, somebody jams his brakes on, the velocity of the car over here, think about the velocity is going 60 miles in, oh, this country would be 90 kilometers an hour, an hour, and whatever it is. And down here it goes to 30, and there's a jump over here, and that's a shock wave. Uh, and the shock wave can move because as he jammed his brake on, the shock wave will move backwards, and you'll eventually start cursing because you'll slow down in Los Angeles. So what I did for a living was solve problems like that, more complicated problems, I hope. And this guy realized that there was a link between this and images, which is a fantastic observation. That images are characterized by edges. When you look around you, when you see somebody, uh, what you really don't see is, is the shirt or anything so much. You see where they end and the background begins, edges. So uh, this uh, wild man came over and asked me about something to do with uh, shock, shock stuff. 
I asked him why he wanted to know about it, and he mentioned image processing. And then he walked away, and I ran after him. And my eyeballs were turning into dollar signs, and, <laughs> and that's how the whole thing started. So we started this company, and uh, we were moving along happily, selling our stuff to the Defense Department, and then all of a sudden the riot came, and strangely enough, we benefited. So here's uh, that's page two of the story, uh, which is not so exciting, but here comes the next part, which is, so I didn't really organize this too well. Okay, and show. Okay, so bear with me. And we go to... I'm going to be doing a lot of this, so be patient. Tattoo. Aha. Okay, so this is the Los Angeles riot in 1991, and we are one of the few people who benefited heavily from this, sad to say. Okay, no. LA riot. Click. Okay, so this is actually real. It's not a movie. It's horrible, actually. Uh, but I spent so many hours looking at this, it was like uh, watching uh, a cartoon after a while. But this is really a very sad story. The truck driver was driving through the, uh, the riot area, and uh, a helicopter was flying over. And he took a picture. And there, there is the picture from a distance. But if you click on it, you circle the scene of interest, and you continue. And you blow it up a little bit. And there it is blown up. And you blow it up some more. Oops. Aha! And look at that. What? Oh, I, I killed mine. Let's see if I can go backwards. <laughs> oh, went back too far. Uh, let me go all over again. Slideshow, view, show. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Click, click, click. Okay. Uh, click. Click. Okay. All right. There's there is a tattoo. Uh, can you see it? Okay. And below, now you can really see it. And this is the restoration of it. And this is the outline of it. And this is the picture that was taken and shown in court after, after they got the suspect. And that actually worked. He got convicted uh, based on this. So that was uh, an unusual application of mathematics, maybe. But it turned into a thriving business, a world of strain. It would never work in Singapore. There's no crime. <laughs> You can catch people chewing gum, probably. <laughs> okay. All right. So exit. So that's an example of the uh, real world. Let me show you some more examples of what seems to be the real world. Uh, fly by. Where's fly by? Okay. So, so there are many uh, aspects to imaging. And here's one. Uh, this is done by Richard Tsai from Taiwan, and now a, student, and now a former student at UCLA. Well, we have here, okay, it's a totally different subject, but the same kind of mathematics. You see that little dot flying around? That is supposed to be a helicopter uh, flying through, and uh, what you see there is real data. That, that, that's Washington, D.C. Those are buildings. Uh, and that's real data we got from a, a company that does this kind of stuff. And what, the goal there is, is uh, interesting. The idea is automatically, if you have a vehicle and it's not, uh, there's no pilot, but you have the data down below, you would like to fly through that region and as efficiently as possible see as much as possible. So this is something for an unmanned uh, UAV or, uh, or something like that, uh, where you automatically just put the data in there. And uh, in this case, you specify an altitude. And then the, the helicopter flies in such a way as to optimize what it sees. Okay? So I'll try to describe how that works a little bit later. That's one example. And again, this is real data. So I guess this is the real world. Okay. Um, here's another example. Same thing. And... Uh, the mathematics here is very similar to the mathematics that was used for enhancing the tattoo and so on. It's based on differential equations, which sounds scary, but not to 
uh, not to some most many people here, but uh, differential equations were more or less invented by Newton a long time ago to get to do mechanics, and I think they do everything essentially. Uh, and once you reduce your problem to a differential equation, you're on your way to solving it. So I, I think it's fair to say that before the mid '80s. Uh, image processing was called digital in image processing, which meant that it was sort of discrete. It wasn't based on continuum type ideas. Okay, what does that mean? It wasn't based on things like, uh, flu like fluid flow is based on or, or mechanics is based on. But now it is. So there's been a revolution, in my opinion, in that subject. Uh, it never could have happened without the computer, but uh, obviously, but what really drove it was new algorithms and a new way of looking at things based on uh, things like mechanics very much. Okay, so that's the real world. Let's do, do some more real world. Let's do some fake world for fun. Uh, where are we? Let me see now. Yeah, here we go. So let's look at some videos. Uh, we have a new governor in California uh, who I admire tremendously because he uses my numerical method in his movies. Uh, the, uh, the movie Terminator 3, uh, which I, I'll never see uh, unless they pay me something. But anyway, in that movie there are uh, special effects. And the special effects were done by this former student of mine, who his name is all over the place there, Fedco. Uh, you should go to his webpage and see some beautiful stuff. Uh, and it's based on a type of mathematics, uh, a, type, a way of representing surfaces and how surfaces deform, which I may subject you to towards the end of the lecture at this time. It's called level set method, great stuff. Uh, and anyway, in, in, the, in, the, in Terminator 3, when the Terminatrix uh, melts, that's level set melting. When Shrek takes a bath, who's seen Shrek here? There are kids here, you must have seen Shrek. Okay, well, check the water out carefully, it's fantastic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Titanic had terrible water. It was linear. Uh, so, uh, but that's all changed now. Uh, so nowadays, when, when they do special effects in the movie using water and flames, they actually solve the physical equations. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. But uh, right now, it, it's not a great way to make a lot of money because there are only a few blockbusters per year. And there's not a big, you know, big market for people doing it. But uh, eventually, video games, if they can be done in real time, then th there will be a huge market. So that, that's an interesting uh, approach. So let's, look a, let's take a look at what uh, Fedco's movies look like. Here's one. Okay. So that's the fake world. This is... Uh, Solved as a combustion problem. It's just a, a burning uh, a piece of wood going through a flame. And it's all done by solving a differential equation, a system of differential equations. Okay. And so uh, stuff like this, when you see it, movies made by Pixar and ILM, it's based on, uh, on this uh, and, and other, and nowadays the other, the other studios are going to use it, are using it. Okay, that's one. What else do we have here? Here's uh, the opposite. Uh, this was actually a basis for a TV commercial. I don't know what they're advertising. Uh, but this is water, obviously. Uh, which looks quite realistic, in my opinion. Okay. So this, this is a just computer-generated water. Uh, but go see the Titanic again, and you'll be disappointed. Okay. What else do we have? More water. Okay. And for those of you in the audience who know what I'm talking about, this is two-phase Navier-Stokes equation done with a single level set function uh, representing the, uh, the bubbles. So uh, one of the interesting things about the method of the, that uh, I might describe later is is that you can do many, 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 many little bubbles and you can allow them to come together and, and merge or split or do all kinds of terrible things without worrying about it uh, in a very simple way by using some elementary geometry, geometric ideas, which uh, maybe I'll describe. Okay. What else, what else do we 
else do we have? Uh, particles. Okay. Video, video, video. Movie file. Here's smoke. This is different. This is done by uh, another guy from Brooklyn, uh, John Steinhoff. It's his idea. It's something called vorticity confinement. It's a method for uh, basically computing flow fields, uh, which he did. So again, it's serendipity. He was designing this to compute flow past a, for helicopter wings, and it turned out to be very useful for simulating smoke. Uh, and this is a simulation of that sort. Okay. Smoke splash. Here we go. This is, this is something like uranium, very heavy object thrown into the water. Uh, we'll see it again. I hope. Does it run again? Yes. Yeah. And again, it's all done. It's not, the calculation is not hard. It's computation intensive, but it's not, it's not really hard to program. And again, it's a serendipity. Uh, how we got into computer graphics uh, is that we were actually doing calculations of this sort for the Navy. Uh, but uh, it turned out that the graphics people like it a lot for fake world. Okay. Well, I think I'm almost finished. Um, is that the end of the movies? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about some of the mathematics behind all this uh, without being too technical for the non-experts. So uh, uh, a reasonable, so let me give you, let me give some more examples perhaps first. Where are we? Uh, triangulation. Yeah. Well, let's do this. So, so this is actually a math talk, but I'll condense it like crazy. Uh, this was done by, uh, this is Richard Tsai, who I mentioned before. Um, just to give you an idea of what's behind these things, this is, this is uh, serious mathematics, which will appear in a technical journal, but it's a very easy idea. And it's easy to describe, I think. So without uh, boring you too much about the technical details, let's see how much I can do. Uh, the problem is called visibility. Uh, it's a very basic question. You are, you are an observer, like me, for example, and I look around here and the question is, what can I see and what is blocked? And uh, it's a very, that's a, it couldn't be simpler. And the information I'm given is all your locations. And then what I want to know is uh, what happens when you move and when I move. And I also want to know what happens if uh, there's something hidden which I want to see. How do I get there? And how do I uh, optimize the path by which you do this? So for those of you who don't like formulas, just ignore the stuff and look at the pictures of how it works. I think we can explain it. Uh, and there are many applications that, for these things. Well, my favorite application is the one I mentioned before, is navigation. How do you navigate through a bunch of buildings, for example, trying to find a terrorist or I don't know what, uh, or uh, you just keep your eye on somebody. Sounds horrible, actually. Uh, as efficiently as possible. And uh, the idea behind all this is to find the region that is shaded. Find the region that is shaded. And you know that the, shade, the shaded region is going to include the, um, the objects, these guys. But it also includes this whole region back here. All right, so the idea is to start out with this bunch of objects and then figure out what that implies in terms of uh, what's visible. And that can be made into a pretentious mathematical thing, but it's really very easy to describe. The basic idea is, if you're standing over here and something between you and the observer uh, is in the uh, occluded region, then you're in the shade. And once you realize that silly, that trivial idea, then you can easily make, get a very fast algorithm to do this. 
And surprisingly, this is new. This is not the way people usually solve this problem. People usually solve this problem by representing surfaces by putting points on the surface. And that's terrible, uh, in my opinion. What you should do is represent the surface in a way I'll describe later. Uh, and that allows you to quickly compute the visible region. So let's see if I can explain how. Now, this is too mathematical, I'm afraid. But the basic idea is uh, if something is between you and the, uh, if an occluder is between you and the observer, then you're in the shade. And once you realize that, then you can make a fast algorithm out of this. And I'll, and I'll go fast. Okay, so we'll skip some of the details and see what I can show. Uh, so some of the things you'd be interested in is how the shadow moves. Uh, so if you're here, this is the horizon, uh, you would like to know what's going to happen when you move, when you can find an object back here. And this setup allows you to do it. Okay, without uh, going into too much detail. And here are some examples. There's an, this is an observer. Uh, there's uh, a hand and there's the, its uh, extension of the rays over here. I'll show you something a little more. Okay, let me see if I get to the... Okay, so here's a, an example of... Uh, this is the Grand Canyon. And this is really the Grand Canyon. I mean, this is data that you can get off the web. Uh, digital terrain elevation data. You're an observer over here. Uh, you're, sorry, you're an airplane over here and you want to know what is visible as you fly across the Grand Canyon. And here are the results. Uh, you start over here, and the shaded region is uh, what you cannot see. And as you go, it becomes less and less shade. So this is, this is not where you actually determine the most optimal path. It's just what happens if you pick a path and what's visible. And again, this uses the same kind of mathematics. It uses elementary differential equations in this case. And uh, the so-called level set method, which characterizes these, all the surfaces you see. Okay. Uh, another interesting question is, if you're given a collection of data points, uh, you would like to fill it up with a surface. So actually, we got the data from Michelangelo's David. Here it is. Uh, unfortunately, all I have is the finished product. But th these are data points that you get from a laser scanner that the Italian government actually sent to a guy at Stanford who's a friend of ours. And so we got to play with it. And you can interpolate this data uh, as a cloud of points, not the way we did it, actually. We can talk about it. Okay. Um, uh, other things you can do is uh, uh, shape reconstruction using ideas like this. Uh, there's a movie, uh, unfortunately I didn't get a chance to download this movie, there's a, uh, something, this object over here, you take two or three pictures of this thing from different angles. And so you're given, and then you try to interpolate a surface, you try to pass a surface through it, and you only use the visible region, and this is the kind of result you can get. This was done by Highland, some people at uh, UCLA, Highland, Jin, and Sawato using our stuff, some of our stuff. And then there's the I want to see everything problem, which I mentioned before, and that's the, that leads into that uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, flyby. Okay. I think I'm finished with this. Oh, no, here, here we go. I'll skip the equations. Uh, and this is, this is the basic idea of that uh, optimization thing. You're an observer over here, and you want to move in such a way as to see as much as possible. So just by knowing the location of these guys, uh, you then determine a path which is optimal for seeing as much as possible, as quickly as possible. This is a hard problem to do it uh, the best possible way. We get one possible path. For the mathematicians in the audience, it's not a convex problem. There's more than one solution. You can probably convexify it. Uh, but anyway, it's work in progress, and this is the kind of stuff you get. You can also weight this region. If, if it's smoky in some parts of the region, for example, like here, it's, uh, in some part of the region, it's, uh, it's, it's harder to see, uh, you move accordingly. 
okay? And this is different. This is what happens if they're, they're, everything is equal, equally likely to be seen. And this is several vantage points. You can, you can also have several observers. They talk to each other, and they move in a way so as to optimize the path. And this very complicated sounding thing is actually pretty easy using this uh, uh, framework. Okay, are we finished with this? Uh, this is more of the same. Okay. Uh, escape. Okay, so uh, next, let me show you. Where's triangulation? Here it is. Uh, okay, slideshow, view show, no, I forget this. Okay, so we're going to go quickly through all this stuff. Let's just get to the pictures. Okay, here we go, pictures. Uh, what am I doing? Uh, we heard a lot of talks about image processing in this meeting I just went to, but uh, this is image processing on surfaces. Uh, the idea is you can give any surface, like this bunny, very famous bunny, which has gone through, been through a lot, Stanford bunny. Uh, and what we have here is uh, an original image. And over here, this is what happens when the image melts. This is actually when you do heat flow on the manifold, so to speak, on the surface, and watch the image melt. Uh, and this is um, when you have constraints, so it stops. This is supposed to be an improvement of this. this better. Okay, this, this is maybe a little more interesting. Here is the, the hair on the bunny, and then you can comb the hair with mathematics. Okay. You have to have hair to begin with, but assuming there's hair, then uh, you can apply differential equations to the direction field and on the surface uh, straighten out the hair. This, this, is, this is a type of uh, noise removal. Okay. Uh, here is some strange man on a... Uh, uh, a teapot turned upside down, very sinister looking. Uh, you've let, we add noise to it, and over here we restore the color image on a surface. So this is like a circus trick. A, it's color. B, it's on a surface. Uh, and uh, we, do, we do both, and the, the results are pretty good. Okay. So this, this, is, this is what's called noise for those people. It's just the kind of thing you see on your TV when it's... In, uh, in trouble. Uh, you can also generate patterns on any arbitrary surface. Uh, so you can color surfaces or, or de you know, develop uh, patterns, stripes, whatnot, uh, using these differential equations. Here's something that's fairly amazing. If you have this checkerboard, which is all messed up, uh, it's hard to believe that by using differential equations, you can put it back together again. The only thing you're given is this, scout's honor. But you're also given the geometry of the surface. So what we have here, again, for the mathematicians of the audience, what I'm denoising is, is not uh, the original image, or the, which is the map from uh, the checkerboard to the surface, but, uh, but uh, I mean, the certain, the, sorry, the, the, the stuff on this, uh, the checkerboard. What I'm denoising is the map. So I have a noisy mapping, and I can, deno I can straighten that out and get this automatically. And here's another example, which is harder to believe, but I promise you it's true. Uh, you have uh, this very strange, noisy texture map on a sphere, and by solving some silly-looking differential equation, you can uh, put it back together again and get these human beings messing around. So there's information in, uh, in this junk, which is uh, easy to find. I could, have made it, I could have made it look harder, even, but uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, it looks a little harder here. That's the one I was thinking of. Okay, so this is on a teapot. So if you ever want to paint the teapot, just come to me. Okay. And here, this is repeated. Yeah, I'll skip this thing. Okay. Um, what else am I going to show you? There was... Uh, Another thing, that, speaking of denoising, let me show you uh, uh, some results which are recent about that sort of thing. Let's see. Uh, not 
this one. Keep going. Plus. Okay. Here we go. Now, this might look boring, but the basic idea is uh, you have a signal, uh, which is correct over here. I showed it yesterday or on Monday. Uh, and noisy over here. And the idea is, is to uh, get the correct signal back. And the techniques that we've developed over the years have the nice property that they get edges very well. And edges, as I said before, are a big par part of the human visual system. In fact, edges and textures are more or less uh, the main part of it. So what we've done is figured out ways of somehow enhancing, getting rid of noise and finding edges in noise. And, uh, see some more examples. Uh, but we can also sort of denoise textures. Uh, here is a, a fingerprint. And this is the noise that was added. Uh, and then you process it. It doesn't work very well because the difference between what you got uh, and uh, the true image should just be noise, but there's some signal here. So we, we go a little further, and uh, eventually we'd get better and better until it's almost uh, noise-free, as you can see. And we still, re we still retain the textures. Okay. Okay. Let's see any more examples like that. Uh, here's another example, which is... Uh, an interesting and difficult case because it has different kinds of features. This is what the noise looks like. Uh, and you try to recover the original image, and at first you do badly, but persevere. And this is the best. You get a, uh, you, you've gone too far over here. So the best one is back here, this guy. OK, this is probably enough of this. How do I leave this thing? Escape. Hmm. No. Okay. Uh, if we're not careful, I'll get into some technical stuff. So let me try to avoid it by showing you a few more kind of cute things. Uh, this is uh, the logo of my company, but forget that. Okay. Slideshow, you show. Okay, let me click quickly through. Uh, go on to something that is kind of fun to see. Oops. Uh, here we go. So this is this is stuff done by Hong Kai sitting over here. Hong Kai Zhao. This is quite old. Uh, this is called interpolation of surfaces. Uh, you're given data points which look like a mess, uh, but the idea is to pass a surface through the points in three space. And you don't know how many times this thing wraps itself around or anything like that. And it turns out that there are simple numerical methods, very simple to go from here to here. And then you can move a little bit, you can move inward and, and this gives you an approximation. And this is supposed to be the correct result. So this stuff over here has something to do with soap bubbles, would you believe? So everything is connected. Uh, the mathematics behind this kind of uh, interpolation is, is, is exactly the same as uh, what keeps soap bubbles together, surface tension. So what we're doing is using physical ideas to do uh, imaging type things, even here. And here's another example of interpolation. And again, this poor old teapot. Okay. This is a rat brain. Uh, they tell me. Uh, and this, so th this is an MRI of a rat brain. And all we're given is data points, and these points are widely uh, separated in some, in some regions. And nevertheless, this is supposed to be an accurate interp uh, interpolation of it, uh, according to the doctors. Uh, and what you can also do, this thing has a mind of its own. Here is a tire with a piece missing. Uh, and if you do the interpolation, you automatically fill it in, which is uh, the preferred 
uh, interpolation that the, that the soap bubble likes better than uh, if you you can change things a little bit so that it will, it will essentially put a patch in here. I mean, essentially it'll go it, it'll get a hole all the way through. But the uh, vanilla version of it gives you that. Okay, here's something else. This is texture extraction. Uh, given an image, you can break it up into a so-called cartoon plus texture. I'll give you better examples later. And we're, we're using this for image compression, but because you can treat each of these pieces differently. Okay, let's skip this stuff. Um, visibility we've seen. Anything more over here? No. Oh, yeah, this is fun. This is, this is work done by uh, Sapiro and his colleagues called Image in Painting. If you have an image like this, uh, with scratches on it, uh, you can automatically fill in the details and blast. I left the original. I, read, I left at home. The uh, how we do that. I mean, uh, I mean this, this particular example, but I'll show you a, a more boring one in a second. This one. Uh, this is used to uh, uh, in wireless transmission. Instead of sending all this information over the web, over the web, you can just so send this data and then interpolate it. And this is a very accurate reconstruction of this. Using, uh, again, this uses the same kind of mathematics. This is all differential equations. Okay. Oh, here's not a bad example. So here is uh, so, uh, this nice flower arrangement and somebody's messed it up a little bit. And you go pling, and the computer automatically fills in the gaps. Okay. So without knowing what was around it, you automatically get something that looks quite realistic. Okay. Uh, and here's another example where you have uh, uh, some texture and structure. Uh, so what we did was break this up into cartoon plus texture, and then you interpolate the cartoon, you in-paint the so-called in-paint the, the, the cartoon, you in-paint the texture, they're very different how you do it. You put it back together again, it looks pretty good. This fills in the gap, and your eye likes what it sees. So this is probably the fake world. We don't know for sure what's really in here, but this looks pretty reasonable. And that's the end of that. Okay. Um, I can show you a little bit more of uh, the graphics that was done by Ron. Uh, some of the things that are, that are really quite interesting is human body. So uh, my former student is involved in a project to uh, uh, model motion and also model uh, the entire human, virtual human. Uh, and this is a uh, bicep he's about to construct. This is, of course, computer graphics. Um, and another difficult thing to do is cloth. In uh, uh, one of the Star Wars movies, Yoda's cloth was done by Ron. Uh, and this is an, this is a kind of this this is virtual cloth. cloth. More cloth. And more cloth. Okay. And finally, what I, what I might do is just give a hint of, of the mathematics behind all this, if that's not uh, too distasteful. Any questions about this stuff, by the way? Okay. So anyway, the, so let's just do a little math, not too much. I promise, where is it? Um, level set, PowerPoint. Okay. This is my favorite transparency. No. Okay. So what is the level set method? Uh, and why does the world love it or or does it? Uh, this is an old transparency. If you type in level set method uh, as of September 17th, you got 8,200 responses in Google. 
the original paper, which I thought was the original paper, actually some, there's some precursors, uh, I just found out about it, uh, done by people who didn't realize how useful it was and abandoned it, uh, was cited quite a bit. Skip that. There's a new book with uh, uh, FEDCO, I might as well advertise, and here it is. So uh, I suggest you race out.